Yeah, as uh, Matt had introduced and, and described here, we are talking about the uh, cyber.org cyber range. Uh, the other Jonathan Bartles, that's my colleague, Joseph McAdam, uh, he may interrupt in the middle of this. This is actually uh, our first webinar advertising the cyber.org cyber range in this type of setting. I'm sure that Joe has, with his role at cyber.org, talked a little bit about the cyber range to DHS and to some other people, but this is uh, our, our first time really introducing it to teachers in this type of format. Might be a little rough around the edges, so... Uh, forgive us for that, but if uh, at any point you want to ask a question, feel free to interrupt. We're not going to be offended here. So we've got a little plan here, kind of a, a three-step plan. First off, a very quick question in terms of what is a cyber range? After we define what a cyber range is, we're going to take a look at who we are as in terms of cyber.org, Joe and I, and really what we have to offer. And then once we do that, we're going to kind of take a little lab that we have written as part of the curriculum that we offer and showcase that on our cyber range. We do have uh, emails here. It's pretty easy to get in contact with us. You can either use this joe.mcadam or joseph.mcadam and then john.bartles or jonathan.bartles. I know there may be some confusion seeing Jonathan with no first H, but John with the H there. When I take John, I take my dad's spelling. So that's why, but both emails work there. Uh, cool. Okay, so a cyber range, you can use kind of a, a safe analogy is to talk about like a science lab. Think about chemistry labs in school, right? Chemicals in a chemistry class can be very dangerous if not used properly. You've got flames from your Bunsen burners, and especially with isopropyl alcohol, very easy to cause a lot of damage if not properly taken care of. Uh, anatomy classes, right, with your scalpels. The whole purpose of these science labs, you're in a safe environment to be able to experiment. A cyber range is a safe environment to investigate cybersecurity best practices. So you can play the role of both the malicious user who's creating malware and the role of the victim to see the mistakes that the victim makes. What we'll be doing is taking a look at a very simple lab near the end of this uh, webinar here, where we set up a little bit of malware, we make the mistake as the victim and see how the malicious user actually gains access to uh, information that I wouldn't want them to have as the victim. In a cyber range, when you're working through these labs, you can discuss preventative and reactive measures to protect yourself against malware, right? The, the best defense is to just not let it happen to begin with, but sometimes you're going to make mistakes and we talk about ways to protect yourself after the fact. Uh, a cyber range is great for classrooms to open dialogues. We also have case studies that we'll see in a second. Uh, all of that just kind of intertwines together. Now we do have a great summary here. If you don't want to listen to me actually talk about it, this hyperlink, the cyber.org slash news slash what exactly cyber range gives a great detail in terms of what a cyber range is, what our cyber range is, why it's unique. And if I have it pulled up, yeah, it does have a great photo of Joe. I think I can switch that easily. <laughs> Oh boy, I yeah, I was like, oh, you're sharing that, okay. <laughs> it's got a great photo of Joe off to the side. So who exactly are we? Well, with cyber.org, we are funded by CISA uh, through DHS to help kind of close that workforce gap that our federal government really sees as a big issue. Now, they may throw numbers out. You may see some numbers as small as maybe 80,000, some as high as 400,000 in terms of open jobs that really need to be filled to help protect people, right? How many of us are relatively new with cybersecurity, right? We don't know all of these attacks that malicious users use. 
we're familiar with some of the, the scams like the Nigerian Prince email or that you've won the lottery in Europe and you just have to submit a $500 processing fee. But there are some more sophisticated things that you don't even realize there's something fishy happening, like installing a, a free game and included in that free game is a little piece of code that's opening up what's called a backdoor to your system and malicious users then just gain full control without you realizing it. Who are we specifically? Well, I'm Jonathan Bartles. Got my colleague here, Joe McAdam. We actually grew up together. Completely different paths. Um, I went to Case Western Reserve University to study mathematics. He actually went to Ohio State University to study mathematics. Uh, kind of went in different directions. I was in California for a few years. I'm in Texas now. Joe was in Louisiana. He's in North Carolina now. Got back together. Joe brought me on to cyber.org to help write a lot of cybersecurity content. Uh, I am main, mainly focused on CompTIA certification courses like Security Plus, uh, Network Plus, IT Fundamentals. So that's who I am. Joe kind of oversees all of the cybersecurity content. He is the director of cybersecurity content. And the only reason I can remember that specific uh, title there is because I had that that web page pulled up with this photo there. We're going to take a quick look at the course that we have to offer, which is at cyber.org. So let me share back the web page here. So I could either log in from this web page, I could go straight to the cyber.org web page, but we've got a little login here. If you're new to cyber.org, you can click the sign up button. Just answer a few questions there. It's always best to use your educator email because this is all human verification. It takes mainly 24 to 48 hours to get a response, to get approval to the course. But once you get approval, you have access to our entire course catalog which we can see things like our cybersecurity course, which is aligned to CompTIA's Security Plus certification. We've got other things like computer science, cyber literacy, cyber society. We can see that IT fundamentals, networking, got a, a lot of courses to offer here. Now the cybersecurity course, this is one of the things we mainly built our cyber range for, but it doesn't have to be used solely for cybersecurity. The reason I'm referencing this, we've got a lot of material here. We've got teacher notes, we have lessons, we've got these resources, and in these resources, we can see some of these labs. So for example, if I scroll down to this credential harvesting section, and don't worry so much about what all of this means, this is aligned to, again, CompTIA Security Plus objectives. We do have webinars, workshops, where we talk about an introduction to the cybersecurity course. This is just having you see we've got material that is written that can work very well with the cyber dot, or yeah, cyber.org cyber range. You don't have to use our material. We like it if you do. Uh, the more people that use it, obviously, the better it is in terms of DHS's eyes to continue to fund us. But I am going to click that credential harvesting. I actually have the lab memorized itself. But just so you see, it downloads a copy of this PowerPoint. I'll showcase the PowerPoint, just kind of see the title slide and run through it real fast just so we can see what it looks like in a second. Now back to the PowerPoint itself. You may be asking questions like, you know, you keep mentioning Security Plus. Why is your cybersecurity course written to that? When we started writing our cybersecurity course, states that did have standards, they weren't all the same standards, but there was a lot of overlap from state to state. And we found that the Security Plus objectives from CompTIA covered at least 95%, if not more, of the state standards that were written, as well as some additional material. Typically, anything that's missed is covered in things like our ITF course or networking course, cyber society. Like some states 
may talk about cyberbullying, and that's not really a security plus objective, but it may be something in cyber society instead. The security plus objectives, they cover threats, attacks, vulnerabilities, cryptography, access management, a lot of stuff. The important thing right here, if students do want to take the security plus exam to try to get certified, CompTIA recommends that you have two years of experience in IT administration with a security focus. High school students can't get that. So what we do is we've written these labs as a way to kind of substitute that experience. There's a few other pieces of information here. It's a very expensive exam, but there are vouchers available. Never, ever want you to try to pay that full price. There are so many different ways to get that price down. The certificate itself is good for three years. If you happen to have students who are freshmen, super advanced, I wouldn't have them take the exam right away because it would expire before they graduate. Sophomores, juniors, seniors, they get that exam, or they, they get the certification. That's great for them right out of high school to get a job. It, it looks amazing on a resume. It's less content than the A+, which is another one of the certifications from CompTIA, but it can be difficult for students. I'd say the networking and the security plus are the two more difficult of their kind of cybersecurity pathway courses. ITF is probably the easiest. A plus, the content isn't necessarily difficult, but there's a lot of it, and it's two exams itself. Oops. We have three different types of labs. So the range itself, we're able to implement all but, I believe, one lab, the max spoofing lab. Is that correct, Joe? Yeah, every lab that we have written except for the max spoofing can be done on our cyber range. And th there are three types. There's example labs. We have what we refer to as tool labs, and we also have attack labs. So the example labs, like a fuzzing lab. So we discuss what fuzzing is. We utilize a tool called OWASP Zap, showcasing brute force and SQL injection. So students get experience that way. We have these tool labs where students get to see things like Wireshark, which is great for capturing packets, viewing packets, and understanding what packets really are. And also the, the Wireshark lab really talks about the risk of using internet in an internet cafe, like going to Starbucks and just connecting to something that doesn't have a password, going to a hotel and connecting to free Wi-Fi, things like that. And then some of the really fun ones, in my opinion, the attack labs. So, for example, our ransomware lab uses the actual WannaCry payload, which a few years back almost wrecked the internet. Students will understand how ransomware attacks really work, how to defend against them. And they, ransomware is definitely one of those ones where it's better to be preventative than reactive, because sometimes if you get ransomware on your computer, it's not so easy to get rid of. You may lose everything and just have to reinstall the operating system itself. But if you can prevent any of that from happening, you're a lot better off. So far, so good. Haven't even talked about Cyber Range officially. Just more so what we are, who we are at cyber.org. Now, the cyber.org Cyber Range. Fairly simple web page to get to, this apps.cyber.org, apps.cyber.org. This is also something that is human verification. So we don't want people to just use bots and access this. Uh, also, DHS is only allowing high school students or high school teachers, or I shouldn't say high school, K through 12 educators to, to access this. So you want access, you don't have an account, apply for one, fill out the very quick questionnaire. And again, within 24 to 48 hours is kind of our goal. It may take a little longer. Joe just had 132 requests. Did, do I have that number right? Uh, a few more than that. We ended up getting uh, close to 200 today, so. <laughs> 
Now it's not typically that high. Uh, that was because the web page that I showed earlier was, was just released, just advertised. So we had a big influx of, of teachers that were interested in this. Now I already have an account here. So I'm going to log in. And this is the main landing page as a teacher. Go to my range here. We can see I've got my teacher account here. Go to kind of treat it like we're just creating our own classroom now. The user interface, we try to make this as simplistic as possible. We don't really have a user manual per se, but we've got a few options here. We could create additional classrooms if we wanted to. Let's say I have some students here. I want to create a small class of five. Pretty simple with that add participants, add up to five. It just randomly generates some names here. And I know that it's been a randomly generated name because of our symbol here. Uh, if you happen to have a class of 40 and you're going through and you're renaming things like, wait a minute, it's day one. I don't happen to know all of my students' names. Am I about to replace a student with another student's name? Am I about to replace one of the randomly generated ones? So that that symbol there helps us. So for example, here, I could click this first one. I could change this to Joe McAdam. I could change the password itself. I'm not doing that. Notice right now it's not showing the password. Here I can see the passwords. We've got generated, randomly generated usernames and passwords. You could actually use one of these usernames and passwords to connect. Uh, you're welcome to. It's a small number of us. And if the two of you, well, Matt included, I guess, if you happen to pick the same one, that's not actually that big of a deal because we use what's called a VNC connection. So you can have, I believe we have it set for five concurrent users. see if I can get this opened up correctly. So I'm going to show this in a student perspective. So let me switch here. I've got an incognito window, so this doesn't have my session stored. So if I happen to use one of those randomly generated usernames and passwords and log in, this is the student dashboard. Slightly different visual. I don't have any virtual machines created right now. Part of a cost savings feature is when we create these virtual machines, they're only alive for two to three hours. So technically two hours and one second up to a maximum of three hours. So there's no persistence here. You may see some other cyber ranges like the US side range they actually keep pers they have persistence. So if you create something on today, January 11th, that machine will stay alive up until the end of the month. That's a difference between ours and the US Cyber Range, but the US Cyber Range happens to be more costly because of that persistence. Just differences. I'm not saying one's necessarily better than the other, because we're on recording. If we were off recording, I would absolutely say ours is the best. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. <laughs> so back on the teacher side here, I've got this green button here for the Launch Cali machine. Again, as a student view, you happen to see the Launch Cali written out. I have a little windows here. You happen to see the launch windows here. I'm going to click both of these right now. And since we've got a small group, I'm actually going to launch all of them. I'm going to launch all six Kali machines. And I'm going to launch all six Windows machines. And we'll see how fast these kind of fire up. The, the Kali machines are a lot quicker to fire up, but it's it's not like it's something that takes an extended period of time for the Windows machines to launch up. What would you say on average, Joe, about 40 seconds for the Kali machines, maybe two to three minutes for the Windows? I think that's about right. Yeah, you just say around a minute for the Kali and then 
Yeah, it was around three minutes for the window. So. Yeah. Now, some of our labs that we have written are only using one of the two machines. Maybe it's only using the Kali Linux machine. Maybe it's only using the Windows 7 machine. Some of our labs utilize both. Typically, the labs that utilize both the Kali machine and the Windows machine, the Kali machine plays the role of the malicious user and the Windows machine plays the role of the victim. There are a few labs where that is not the case. Like we have some command injection, some SQL injection labs where we access an intentionally vulnerable web application called DVWA. It, it actually stands for the damn vulnerable web application. Again, being safe with students, we can say dang vulnerable web application or just DVWA. And what we're doing on the Windows side is we're actually attacking the server that's housed on the Kali machine. Outside of that, if we're utilizing both, really the Kali machine would be the malicious user, the Windows would be the victim. Once we see this booted, I now have the ability to click open one of these. So if I click open my Kali here, still within the same tab, it opens up a Kali Linux desktop. I could switch to the Windows 7 machine once that gets launched. What I like to do, instead of clicking this machine, which is one option, I can click the machines. Once that Windows is fully fired up, I can open it up from here. What I like to do is open a second tab. And so once that's finished setting up, I can just click back and forth between the two. It's just a difference in preference. Again, once the Windows machine is fired up, I could bounce back and forth from machine to machine. And since I'm the teacher here, I actually have access to all of these different ones. So if someone happens to be in Caney's, I'm going to open it up. Hopefully there's nothing inappropriate happening here. But I can jump around, I can navigate from to machine to machine, which is great in a classroom setting because if all of my students are working on something and they need troubleshooting, rather than me having to go directly to them, I can access their machine from here. Joe, are you maybe in this classroom as well? Because if you are, would you mind opening the terminal for Kaney? I'm not, but I can be. Is it under apps or which one you're under? Uh, that one was was my my personal one. It, it's okay if you're not there. This is going to show that we could have multiple people in at the same time. And the only issue is if one person's trying to click one place, the other person's trying to click another place or typing, it can conflict with each other. But you can have multiple people in at the same time. So you could watch your students either secretly or you could, um, you know what, let's, uh, let's get back here, Joe. I think I might have a good password for you because I'm in Caney's. Let me get you this real fast. And while I'm waiting for Joe to get logged in here, our Windows machines have now fired up. So I can open up my Windows 7 machine from here. So I've got access to the Linux machine. Again, right now I'm, at, I'm in Keeney's, but the Windows 7, I'm in my Windows 7. Now there, there may be a question in terms of why Windows 7? Why not Windows 10? Why not Windows 11? Ah, there we go. Joe is is in here right now, I can see Joe typing. And at the same time, I can type as well. It's a difference between a VNC connection and an RDP. A VNC is a little friendlier for multiple users. RDP by default allows one user. So if someone else tries to get in there, it's going to kick you out. So a Windows 7 machine, is a legacy machine. It means a few things. One, it's not going to be updated. Windows 10, Windows 11, they're still being updated constantly, which is good, right? I mean, if there are vulnerabilities with our current machines, like this computer that I'm on right now is a Windows 10. If there's a vulnerability on Windows 10, 
I would hope that Microsoft would work on patching that. Windows Defender is a pretty strong tool. Windows Defender is a little more of a reactive thing than a preventative thing. Like if I am installing known malware, Windows Defender is going to see that. It's going to try to stop that. It might quarantine it and it might delete it. But Microsoft is trying to stay on top of current malware and stop all that. Windows 7, they're not touching it anymore. That's great for us for educational purposes because I can make malware and I can test it. Right On the Kali machine, we're going to showcase this credential harvesting lab that definitely would get stopped if I was trying to do this on my Windows 10. Windows 7, it's not going to be patched. So whatever vulnerabilities exist now will continue to exist so we can continue to learn. Let's see. Make sure I am. There we are. All right. So. We see we've got both of these. We've got our Kali Linux machine. We've got our Windows 7 machine. Just going to quickly showcase our credential harvesting lab. If you're familiar with a Linux machine, that's great. If not, the credential harvesting is one of our simpler labs. Now, hopefully, if you're lost, that's OK. You know, this is on recording. And then we offer workshops throughout the year where Credential harvesting happens to be one of the labs that we look at. Uh, if you're ever interested in any of the workshops that we offer, cyber.org slash events can get you there. I think uh, one of these might be an option here. There we go. So if you're interested in our passwords and cracking passwords workshop, we've got that there. We've got a bunch of different options here. All right. Now, let me get zoomed in because I know sometimes we may be using smaller screens. Like if I'm on my laptop and trying to do this, so it's a lot smaller, it's a lot more difficult. If I'm on my desktop, much larger screen, I've actually got that quartered off and each quarter is bigger than the laptop. But if you are on something smaller, zooming in a little just helps you see it a little better. This credential harvesting lab, it uses a tool called the social engineering toolkit. To get that fired up, I just run the command sudo se toolkit. Again, don't worry too much in terms of what all of this means. I'm agreeing to the terms. If you're trying to follow along, that was just a Y for yes. I do like to joke that this credential harvesting lab is as easy as one, two, three. I repeat one, two, and then I get distracted. This is a social engineering attack. Here's my one. I hit one, type enter. We're using a website attack vector. Here's my two, enter. Yeah, I know I'm going fast. This is to showcase the connectivity between two machines. They can communicate with each other. Credential harvester attack method, right? We're using credential harvesting. So three, there's my symbol is one, two, three. We're using a built-in web template. So back to one. There's a very quick question here. SE Toolkit wants us to verify that it's communicating with the correct IP address. One of the nice things that we've set up here is there's a very easy way to get our IP address with that machines button. We've also changed it from the default uh, prompt here so that I can see my IP address when I open up a new terminal. We could run ifconfig is a command to get my IP address. There are a bunch of different ways to get that. But I verify, yes, this is the IP address I want this to communicate with. So I just type Enter. And if I mimic a Google web page, I might fall victim. So everything I've done here on the Kali Linux side as the malicious user I have set this up where I'm waiting for someone to play to, to fall victim. In the real world, I'd probably do a, a little bit more where I'd send out thousands upon thousands of emails, or maybe I'd be spear phishing. I'd be looking for a whaling, someone very powerful, maybe oh, 
Elon Musk, Bill Gates, someone who's got a lot of money. If I can maybe get access to some of their accounts, maybe I can retire early. But I'd said that out. Hopefully they fall victim to it. Now on the Windows side here, I can open either Internet Explorer or Google Chrome. Actually, I, if I remember right, I think Internet Exploder displays this a little nicer. We'll find out in a second. I need my Cali IP address since I have this set up. And if you didn't set that up yourself, you can still connect to mine because the way that our cyber range is built, which I hadn't mentioned earlier, this classroom that we're all in, all of our machines are able to talk to each other. They can't really connect to the outside world. They do have internet access, but ICMP traffic is blocked. So I can't attack your physical computer, your host machine. But our virtual machines, they're in the same classroom. They can communicate with each other. That's another one of those safety features, right? We don't want this in the outside world where things really may go wrong and cause some damage. Same thing like our chemistry lab, right? It's all in safely practiced within the classroom itself. So on my Windows side here, all I need to do is go to my Cali IP address, which was 10.15.127.123. And again, you're welcome to navigate to this same IP address in your Windows machine. If you try to access this from your personal computer, so you're using Windows 10, you're using Windows 11, you're using one of the Mac operating systems, because of the way that this is isolated, because of the way the cyber range is built, you won't be able to access this from that machine, but you will be able to access it from the cyber range itself. If it doesn't want to load properly in Internet Exploder, I will instead open this up through Google Chrome. I always forget which one it looks nicer through. The fact that it's loading like this. Okay, let's see. Oh, no, there we go. I was just too impatient here. There are some nice security features with things like Facebook and Instagram and Yahoo and Twitter constantly updating the way that their login page looks because it's not as easy for things like this to happen. Google hasn't been that great with updating the login page. Now, I do think it looks a little different today, but for the longest time, it looked like this. And outside of seeing this URL, which I, if I was a malicious user, I'd buy something that looks like Google. Maybe the L is a capital I. Maybe I use a Russian character that looks like an English character. But upon a quick glance, I don't see anything wrong with the URL. And nothing else looks wrong, right? Like it looks like a legitimate Google login. I'm not going to give you my credentials, but I will log in as Joe here. I'm not going to tell you what his password is. That wouldn't be very secure. And I think I actually typed something wrong. I don't want to remember passwords, right? I want this to be nice and secure. So I entered a username, entered a password, right? As the victim, I don't really know I did anything wrong yet. The only thing that might stand out is the fact that in the top right here, it says sign in. I am at Google's webpage. I'm, I'm at google.com. It has navigated there after I clicked sign in, but I didn't sign in. That's really the only thing that might stand out as something, something odd's happening. If I go back to <laughs> someone else that connected, there we go, Mary Little and Little Lamb. Going back to the Cali machine, I've collected some inputs 
in plain text. It's not even encrypted. The victim directly sent this to me because of the way that I had this set up. So, oh, I, I guess his password was secure panda. Doesn't sound very secure to me. But we can see, oh, I've got another connection here. We may have someone soon enter a username and password. Remember, this is being recorded. Joseph.McAdam, even more secure panda. He's got some capitals there, so that is more secure. So you can have a little fun, right? The students would love things like this. But we can we can see how this is connected, right? How the Kali Linux machines are connected to Windows 7. The classroom itself is all in its own big bubble. If any of you did try to access that IP address from your host machine, from your physical machine, it wouldn't work. Like if, if I did try to go to, what was that, 10, 15, 127, 123. If I try to go there from my host machine, from my physical machine, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. The cyber range is isolated from the outside world. Can't get, can't get access here. Do we happen to have any questions in terms of our canvas page, the range itself? I know it's a lot of material all at once because it gave a very, very, very fast um, overview of our Canvas material, but we did extract uh, a lab itself. Oh, I did say I was going to share what the labs itself looked like. Let's see. Share. So when we download lab itself, we talk about the tools that are needed Right, we used both the Kali Linux machine because we were playing the malicious user, and we needed the Windows 7 machine because we were playing the victim. And the software tool that we used was the social engineering toolkit. And then it gives us some definitions here, and then a step by step breakdown of how to run through that lab, going through the easiest one, two, three, and some of these that do have malware things. We talk about how to defend against them, right? So with credential harvesting, only use credentials at trusted websites, right? Look at that website URL, make sure that you're actually at the correct location. You really don't want to use the same password across multiple websites either, because you could fall victim to a credential stuffing attack where, say, my password is Secure Panda on Facebook, on Chase Bank, on my apps.cyber.org, if they have access to one of them and I'm using that same password, they'll just start going to a random website seeing, oh, maybe it's also the same username and password for their bank accounts. Maybe it's also the same username and password for Facebook, et cetera. You can also protect yourself with two-factor or multi-factor authentication. You'd still have given them your plain text password, but if they try to log in, right, I get a text message saying, are, are you sure that you want to log into this unknown device? Here's the code. Like, oh, I'm not trying to log in. What happened? Et cetera. And I did see a question and Joe had responded to that. Thank you, Joe. Um, let's get out of that. Can we extend the time machine? Yeah. So anywhere over two, but under three hours. Uh, another thing that can be done, so if I go back to the range itself, if I click this return to dashboard, if I'm done, I can terminate these ahead of time. So it is programmed to self-terminate. Again, it's a cost-saving measure, but you know what? I'm happy that I have done the lab that I wanted to do, I can terminate this machine. So terminate and then 
sorry if anyone's kind of playing around in any of these. It's going to be terminated. I'm going to terminate all six Kali machines. I could choose individual ones, but just to showcase the feature here. Deleting that cost-saving feature. We're very appreciative if you happen to be teaching and you took 45 minutes to use the range itself and had your students terminate that. It saves us a few pennies because those pennies add up. One penny from 40 students, from eight classrooms, from 20 schools, from 50 states. It could add up quickly. I played around with it for just a little bit, and I was very impressed. I found the machines very responsive. I've set up uh, virtual machines and uh, before, and when working in them, the machines were kind of sluggish. So I was very impressed with the the response of the machines. And, and I think that's interesting because the machines are actually, they're really, really small. They're T3A smalls and uh, T2 smalls up on uh, AWS, which are really, really small machines. Um, yeah, I, I know what you mean, Sharon, there. The connection's perfect. Um, you will notice with the windows, I mean, sometimes when you open an application or something, it does take a hot minute for it to turn on. But um, yeah, they're for how small they are. They, they run pretty smooth. So uh, we're pretty proud and happy with that. So. Okay, so in the window itself, there's some cyber tools. So these are just things that, as you did with the credential harvesting, that we could probably uh, pull into the our instances. Uh, You're talking we're... under apps. Uh, cyber tools. Yeah, so those are just <laughs> those honestly are just little tools. Um, it, it's mainly like ciphers and things like that. Um, just kind of encryption tools um, that are used. Um, they they technically don't go alongside the range, but we they're, they're created by college kids that have fun trying to make these things. So we give them for options to teachers that they want to talk about. I mean, what do you have here? Have option to change from uh, characters to base 64. You have an Enigma machine created a World War II Enigma machine here, a Visionaire cipher, different things like that. So um, those are separate from the range while they both live on apps.cyber.org. But those are, yeah, just kind of little encryption things. We throw them into some activities with um, some lessons um, not in the cybersecurity course, but in other courses we have at cyber.org. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. How do you get rid of your class? I noticed that you, you created a class with five students on the fly. Um, once those machines are terminated, the class is terminated as well. The yeah. class still lives. The class still lives. You can just rename the class or whatever, but the class will just stay there because it does create like a security group and stuff. So we don't want to get rid of it. So you can get rid of all the kids inside of it, but in the end, the class still lives. So. All right. So you so you always have a class of five. No, so uh, Barles is, I'm assuming after this workshop, going to go delete everyone, especially since this is recorded. He doesn't want that username and passwords up there. Um, and so he'll delete all the users from it and actually he'll bring it down to just, just the teacher at that point. So yeah, he's showing you here, so. Good, yeah. Yeah, if I select- Oh, I see it, I see it now. Okay, thank you, that makes sense. Good enough for me.